Hello and welcome to the TalkCast Pod Show, the number one show on the internet and the great escape from the monotonous nine to five. Ow! I'm Lanny, your host, oh yeah, and I'm joined this week by my buddy, the middle management tiger, Kaiser Neko. How you doing, Kaiser? Rawr. <laughs> indeed, indeed. X3 <laughs> and, pounces on you. Ooh, hell yeah. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and we're also joined by a very special guest, the hyena with a heart of gold, and number one in all of our hearts, ah. the wonderful and talented Mr. Ben Diskin. How Hello. you doing, Ben? Hello. How you guys doing? Uh, uh, doing good. Very excited to have you on here. Uh, yeah. Very excited to talk about this uh, wonderful, wonderful show, uh, which we haven't had a chance to like really talk about on the TalkCast so far. So this will be part retrospective and part just going over all about season three here. Heck yeah. No doubt I am talking about Agretzko. Yeah, Gretzko is one of those is one of those shows that I've that I've covered at a four team four star before on uh, the old uh, four star bento stuff. But yeah, mm-hmm. this will be the first time we've talked about it on uh, the Talkcast Pod Show, and the first time I'll have really talk to you about it at great length. So. Yeah, I think so. I don't uh, I don't really get to talk about this show in detail on most uh, podcasts unless I just like basically take over and go. All right, I'm going to talk about my feelings. And you're going to sit there and you're going to listen and like it. So this will be fun. Speaking of your feelings, uh, in it's very plain to see, like back when season one was coming out. Oh, oh, that, oh, oh wait a uh, sec, wait a sec. Um, oh. Spoilers. Yes. Spoilers. Are we going to be talking uh, about spoilers? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yes, definitely. We, yes, we will, we will be talking spoilers for season three, most certainly, and inevitably one and two at that yes. because you know you, you can't talk about season three without talking about the other two seasons true true yeah yeah so, yes. so yeah heads up to everybody in the audience if you haven't watched Gretzko's seasons one through three you definitely do yeah definitely do but don't stick around for this until you do yes thank you spoiler alert there will be spoilers yeah, thank you well played thank sir you. all right and normally i hold normally i hold off on those until we start getting into spoiler oh, territory oh. and it says ben we'll, low volume am i too quiet I don't believe so. I had you know, pretty leveled out on my end. He's coming mm. kind of quiet on my side. I mean, not on my end. Whatever. Yeah. Well, I'll I'll adjust as uh, need be. I'll, I just boosted you by about thirty oh. percent there. But All right. uh, going back uh, to it, like when season one was coming out, it was pretty plain to see from your Twitter timeline that you had uh, you you had kind of fallen in love with this show. Oh, I, yeah. I'm curious at, at the process of that. Did it start, uh, was was it kind of a, a love at first sight or was it a uh, an awesome gig that just turned into so much more for you? Uh, so when I first started doing, the, I, I got the auditions and I was like, oh, okay. Oh, you, people are saying I'm a bit low. All right, I'm gonna crank this up from, for, there you go. That, that should be good. Um, what uh, what I felt while I was doing the auditions was this looks cute. I like this, and um, uh, I, I sent it in. And then I was like, "All right, I'm gonna just I'm I, I'm gonna try for a couple of the roles. I think I tried out for uh, Tone, I tried out for Comia, and I tried out for Haida. And I, uh, I I sent them out, and I was like, eh, "This will be nice." And then I booked it, and I was like, "Oh, okay, cool. You know, I should probably watch this because I know that this already exists." I thought we were just dubbing the uh, aggressive Retzko shorts. There's like a uh, hundred mm-hmm. of them total. Um, and I did that, and I was like, "Oh wow, this is like really, really good. I'm really happy to be on this this show. I wonder when I'm actually going to come in because it doesn't seem like any of my audition lines are actually part of these things. I wonder." When that's going to happen. <laughs> and then it turned out it's actually a show. <laughs> um, yeah. That's how that, yeah, it was cool. And I, you know, I, think I remember people, oh, trying out uh, for Haida, and weirdly, and I don't know why, but the dialogue made me think, I think this guy has a crush on the main character, and I'm going to play it like that <laughs> in the audition. And it turned out I was right. But, yeah. <laughs> Good read. Yeah, yeah. who knew? <laughs> Very um, strong read on that. It is sort of interesting that a lot of people didn't know about Gretzko much at all until the Netflix series was announced. I remember hearing a little bit about like, oh yeah, Sanrio is going to introduce this uh, red panda character who sings death metal. Um, But it wasn't until the show came out that I found out that they'd made over a hundred shorts. Yeah. Yeah. And they're, I don't know if they're canon at all. Cause they like cover some of the stuff that's in the show, but they handle it differently. Like, uh, from season two, Anai shows up in the shorts, but he's portrayed differently than he is on the show. So I feel <laughs> like it's kind of like proto Agretzko. You know what I mean? I see what you mean. Yeah, no, that absolutely makes sense. It's 
it's definitely something that uh, I, I'll be honest, I heard nothing about it until the show came out on Netflix and the buzz started uh, whirling around it, gave it a shot, loved it pretty much right away, right from the first intro. I'm like, okay, yeah, no, this is, this is my speed. Uh, but learning that it was essentially a mascot character created uh, for the company Sanrio uh, that just turned into so much more. It, it's it's kind of apt to maybe compare it to kind of like the Hello Kitty of this generation almost, just in terms of its uh, appeal and style and its uh, relatability to the uh, general public. I do believe that Sanrio made the, the Hello Kitty for adults. Pretty much is is what is what a Gretzko like feels like because the visual the visual style is adorable. Uh, like all the characters have uh, are immediately appealing just by looking at them. You you immediately know what they're about, and it has that level of charm to it. And what uh, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly, Raracho or Raracho. It might be Raracho. It, it might be Radico. I'm not sure either. Yeah, like, I, I, I know how he spells it, but I'm like, I think it's Radico I, with a K? K? I'm not sure. Yeah, if, if anybody here was going to know, it was it would probably be you as somebody who's more uh, <laughs> more in on the inside of the project yeah. there. Yeah, but, but no. <laughs> uh, what what he did was just turn this she. into this beaut... Oh, she. I am so sorry. No, no, no. no, no, no. You're, See, you're... This, this is this so, is how little I okay, know. Okay, hang on. No, no. Uh, so, Radiko is a guy. Oh, uh, really? His wife uh, is the one who created Retsuko, the character, oh. and also uh, uh, voices her in the Japanese. Yeah. Oh, okay. Eat, All right. Eat shit, Kaiser. Wow. I was right. And, okay, fine. But, but he <laughs> voices the death metal version of her <clears throat> in the Japanese. Oh, that's really neat. Yeah, so it's like husband and wife basically tag teaming on the same character. It's kind of cool. That's neat. That is really awesome. But what what they've done is basically like create this uh, letter to the struggle of like young adult society. Like it, it's 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 bizarre how universal it is because for for like a Japanese show to translate so well to English. Oh yeah. Yeah, I mean it's especially cuz it's really focused on specifically Japanese work culture, but mm -hmm. like some of those things are just universal. Like everybody's got a shitty boss, everybody's got annoying coworkers. So it's that kind of thing that just I think it just crosses a lot of intercontinental lines very very easily. Yeah, I think the uh, the major thing that doesn't translate so well is the work culture of getting drinks afterwards, the uh, the, the group outings and stuff like that. That's but true. even then, uh, I've I've heard of some people are like, yeah, now I get drink with drinks with coworkers every so often, so it's not that much of a divide. No, yeah, but I, I think it's more like the the scheduled drink outings. Yeah, I think that's like what mm -hmm. we don't do that. No, we don't like yeah, you got to go drink with your coworkers. It's part of your job. Let's all celebrate together. Oh yeah, and that the and the culture of. Yeah, you know, drink. No, seriously, drink with everybody. It's the only way you're going to be able to socialize. In fact, <laughs> there's a part of there's a part of our culture that getting drunk allows you to say things with each other that you otherwise struggle to do. It is so interesting to me. Mm. Yeah, it definitely seems more quintessentially like '90s American culture, which is you know, like it, it's just been a part of Japanese culture for uh, that same amount of time and just continues moving forward. But it's like it, it's still that level of relatability, especially the idea of needing something in your off time that's just kind of yours to blow off steam. Mm. Yeah. And uh, so, so moving moving through the series, um, what was the moment you think that uh, was just like you you were hooked on this show, like you you absolutely fell in love with it? Do, do you have like a moment when you were either like in the booth recording for things? It's just like oh, I. I'm, I'm gonna dig on this, and this is gonna go over very well. Uh, well, it was it was actually just watching the shorts uh, originally was what I went. Oh wow, this is actually really really funny and cute, and I like this. But the show itself, yeah. Um, uh, th there's I I feel like, like like look, we do take kind of uh, some creative liberties with the English adaptation script. You kind of have mm -hmm. to when it's a comedy yeah. because otherwise a lot of that those jokes just really don't transfer translate well without it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I kind of, I feel like it's probably something that Fenico would have said is probably something that like, uh, made me go, oh, this is fantastic. Okay. I like this. 
because I feel like they consistently give her some of the absolute best, like, zingers in the show. And uh, season three is definitely no slouch on that. Um, but, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah it, was, it would probably be something somebody else said rather than something I said. I won't lie. Fenico does have literally the best line in the entire series in season three. And I bet you know which one it is. Well, it's one of two. It's either Slice of Hide a Pie or Inside Voice is Dead, and they're both in the same scene. Oh, okay. Now, I was actually going to go with... Oh, what was your favorite then? Oh. Caught Red Panded. Oh, that's right. I totally forgot about Caught Red Panded. <laughs> yeah, that line slayed. I couldn't... Oh, my God. Uh. <laughs> I, have, uh, I, I have some friends that have watched this show uh, just, you know, in the original Japanese sub. I, I personally have only experienced its... Uh, in English, so you know. the uh, the amounts of uh, localization that goes into it, and and how much like changes, or even like just by watching it, how much seems to change, is surprising with how how much it absolutely still fits. the The localization writers for this have done an amazing job. Yeah, that's, to make this feel like such a fluid translation. That's all uh, Patrick Seitz and. Um, <clears throat> Kirsten, whose last name I keep forgetting, but she's his girlfriend, and they work together on, like, multiple projects. It's the two of them basically combined of just, like, taking the translation, going, all right, how would somebody who speaks English say this, and figuring out the best way of doing it. And it, like, they they put so much time into, like, really branching things out in, like, everything they do. Uh, they're, they're also the same people who worked on uh, Fire Emblem Three Houses, so if anybody mm. enjoys playing that game, again that quality of writing comes from those two people specifically like they they bust their butts to like make stuff good and i really appreciate it and they it damn sure did a, a bang up job when it came to translating this uh but when i it's funny i was talking to my friend caitlin about the uh, about season three because she had watched it she watched it in the uh subtitle because that's how she'd been experiencing it up until now and she's and she and i had different takeaways for some scenes just because of the localization yeah, no, uh, it makes sense. Just like some of the messaging within it, like how, uh, like some of the themes translated differently. And it's actually kind of cool. So I'm actually debating going back and watching it through in Japanese. See like, okay, so what, what was the context in this scene that really would have like changed uh, the way you look at it? Uh, it it's, it's, an, it's a really cool nesting doll of a show like that. Yeah, and you know, it's, it's such a, this show is particularly emotionally complex. And mm -hmm. so there's always that part of me that wonders, well, like, if I really spoke Japanese, not reading subtitles, but, like, spoke yeah. it, would I have a different take on the characters? Like, is... Because, I mean, like, even for the subtitles, like, the official ones for Netflix, there are... You could make you could make arguments of, well, that's not quite actually what they meant. Like, a really good example um, is in season one, uh, it ends with um, Haida confessing that he has feelings for Retsuko. And anybody who is an American who either watches the dub or who watches the subtitles were sitting there going, gee, I wonder what she's going to say. Why was this never like addressed after like this scene? But if you actually are Japanese and you speak Japanese, you know she's going to turn him down. And that's something that's not conveyed in either the subtitles or the dub. And that's one of those things where I'm like, well, gosh, is it like how much, like how accurate is some of the stuff that we get? And it's it's always like, well, we just got to do the best we possibly can to, to make sure that the original intention is being translated over. And sometimes it works and sometimes it's just really, really tough to do, if not impossible. There's actually a scene in particular that I'd like to bring up, and it is very late into the show, so we're going to just break right into spoilers, but there was actually a line in particular that stuck out to me when I went back to it and watched it in Japanese. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it's kind of a sledgehammer upside the head when you realize the changes that were made between the English version and the Japanese version, but the way that it's delivered in the Japanese version is actually very similar to the English version, but the wording is so different you wouldn't notice. Um, and it's when Haida is talking to Inui after he's, you know, holding... Retsuko on the ground. Mm -hmm. Holy shit, that's the scene I was talking about, too. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. That, that, and during that scene, um, Inui basically, basically gives up the gut is like, look, you are, ob you obviously have things for this girl. And I just, I, I obviously, I'm obviously out of this. Mm -hmm. And Haida responds in the Japanese version with saying, you know, I, I, I'm stupid, but if I had thought about it a bit more, I would have picked you. And then it, you know, shows Inui 
narrowing her eyes and then it goes back to Haida and then he says, I'm sorry. Right. And the interesting thing about the line in the English version is that as you know, you have you, know, you and the scriptwriter uh, had him say, um, I would have picked and then cut to you know, wait, then back to Haida, her. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that there was, was. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, we we made that change, uh, and and this was brought up to this this was actually brought to our attention. Um, I believe his name is Scott Tanako. I'm, ah, dang it! I know I'm messing. His name is Scott. Um, he works um uh, at VSI the studio, and he speaks he's Japanese and he speaks Japanese, and uh, he he told us about this. And um, the reason why we went with it the way we did was because the the original Japanese basically has him just sort of saying, I would have picked you, and then he apologizes. But what we thought would be, uh, would hit a little bit harder is if he's about to say you, and then she narrows her eyes at him, and then he just finally like gives up the goat and says her. It's it's just a little bit more clear uh, rather than just like, I would have picked you, sorry. It's, it's kind of, it's more like, yeah. yeah, sorry. Yeah, you're right. I would have picked her. So it, it, the Which, meaning is the same, but like the word choice just felt like it hit like the audience a little bit harder of like it, oh fucking god like jesus christ this this stupid idiot but you know like at least he's being true to himself i guess but oof like it doesn't like it's like it's funny because he he just saved her life but it doesn't come across as romantic to me to me it comes across as like tragic because here he is just like going like yeah this girl has no interest in me you do but fuck, I'm not into you. I'm so sorry. And then it just like ends, and it's like, oof. Yeah. <laughs> which, which, as a uh, a brief sidebar, I want to say that that moment in the series, uh, that was probably one of my favorite like uh, vocal performances in that season. So major kudos to you because the yeah. delivery on that oh. was just so damn believable. Thanks. Yeah, uh, that no, one hurt it me. Was, I liked you, anyway. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, it was I... great. Uh, but this also plays into kind of like the uh, what, what I kind of saw as one of the biggest overrunning themes of season three, which was the idea of uh, your passion versus logic. Yeah, which which every season kind of had like a, a big theme to it. The, the first season was about uh, just trying to survive the mundanity of, you know, your your strange co-workers and the the weird adventures of uh quote unquote mundane day to day life in middle management slash accounting slash wherever you might be in big corporate whatever them. Uh season two was about the uh struggles of young adult dating life primarily. And, and then, then I. this one and yeah. I. <laughs> By the way, sidebar, uh, I, I love the fact that, like, in season three, Anai is, like, the most, like, mature one ever. He, like, really grew the hell up and, like, got his shit together. <laughs> and, and there's and there's a thing to that, actually. I, I think one of the biggest parts, like, what I'm talking about with uh, uh, passion versus logic, he found the perfect balance. Yeah. He found somebody who, uh, like, is very supportive of his passion, which is his uh, food blog, basically. And... You know, he does his work, he's very efficient at it, and he goes and does his side hustle because, you know, that's what fulfills him. I yeah. like how you said he found the perfect uh, balance. Yeah, her name is Hakami, and she is small. <laughs> 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 he's got this tiny girlfriend, and I loved that moment. I'm like, oh my god, she's so tiny. <laughs> That was a great. Uh, that was a great scene where you're just like walking, uh, walking back to his uh, you don't apartment. Have a drunk. Girlfriend, what are you talking? Oh, wow, boy, virtual reality's really come a long way. This is real life. <laughs> Billy, <laughs> Billy Kometz, fucking, oh my god, I, oh. He, and I only gets a couple of scenes in in that season, but. They're so good, and Billy sells them so hard. This is why I send emails! <laughs> and it, it was really funny because, oh god, I hated and I so, so much in season two. He was yeah. such a pain in the ass, especially as somebody who's had to deal with people like that before. People who are really sensitive and bad at wound, confrontation. Wound super tight. Yeah. And so, yeah, it was, it was great to see that development for that character. And again, great performance from from commits. Oh yeah. 
Yeah, the, the entire cast has done an amazing job. Yes. Uh, a, a lot of the newcomers this season. Sun Wan Cho, an immediate standout. Oh, my mm. God. Uh, <laughs> yeah, as, uh, as Hyodo. Just... Hyodo. Hyodo is one of my new favorite characters, by the way. I love that goofball. That God. fucking... He's so he's so amazingly complex. Like just as a character, he comes like he's just so stern. He is it, he the trope you think he's going to be when he shows up just takes a fucking like head spin. And this show is so good about giving you that kind of dizzying juxtaposition. Uh, sometimes too good at it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, moving on into specifically spoilers about season three. Uh, Probably my favorite season, not gonna lie. Like, e even with all, like, the weirdness that kind of comes with it and how it, it is significantly more surreal than the other two seasons. Yeah. It is It is my uh, favorite season as well. Um, I, I definitely have to say, like, out of all the three seasons, this one gave me the highest amount of both entertainment and emotional, like, engagement. Even if I think the uh, finale of the season's up in the air. Yes, it's 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 odd. The we'll get to the, we'll get to the finale because there's 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 a lot be to a talk larger. About. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there's a lot to unpack on yes, that one. That is the best way of putting it. <laughs> but with the characters they introduce with Hyodo uh, and uh, the idol group OTM Girls, which he uh, produces for and manages poorly, mind you, uh, and a Gretzko, sorry, Retzko joins with them to. Pay off a debt because she like wrecked his or like ran into his car, ran into his van. Uh, it's, it's such it's such a quirky little misadventure that turns into so much more. Uh, that's a nice way of putting it. If that's a good way yeah. of putting insurance fraud, but yeah, <laughs> wackiness <laughs> ensues. <Yeah. laughs> Wacky insurance fraud. Oh, I don't he know uses how long. Her. I, I don't know. It's cute. I, 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 yeah, complete blackmail. But you know what? It, it helped her. It helped her. <laughs> oh yeah. It was it was good in the long run. Just bitter medicine. Sure. <laughs> By the way, um, you want to know something interesting uh, that a lot of people in the audience may not know about the OTM girls? Uh, no, mm -hmm. I don't. I'm just oh. kidding. Yeah, I do. I'm well, just yeah, I'm good. too fucking bad for you. <laughs> this is our show, not yours. Oh, okay, um, fair. So, uh, Manaka, Migi, and Hidarin, uh, mm -hmm. their names mean middle, left, and right. Oh, that's not where I thought you were going with this, but okay. <laughs> oh, uh, also they have an album out, which is kind of neat. Yeah, they they actually released an album that you can buy. Yes, and I, I think they're going to be on tour somehow. I'm sorry. Yeah. Are, are we are we are we getting like holograms, or is it just going to be I, an on screen thing? I, I think it might be like the actual singers. Uh, who who do the characters? I think. Um, but yeah, oh. it's like it's all in Japanese, so I can't really tell. They have like the English website and the Japanese website. The Japanese has tons of information, and the English one has barely anything. But like, yes. <laughs> not not gonna lie, their song kind of slaps. I, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> fucking liked it. Fucking liked it a lot. I won't lie. I kind of liked it a little bit better in Japanese because the English lyrics are a little uh, English. But they, they're, they're a fun. little Englishy. But it's not. You know what? It's not as bad as "We Wish You a Merry Christmas" from the Christmas special, which was a oh, little bit more. Mm. Mm, yeah, but this one, I'm I'm still okay with it. I like. Uh, uh, yeah, I, and I, honestly, I really like Jameson. Boaz or Boaz, I never know how to pronounce his last name, but the guy who does uh, the death metal version of Let's Go for English is oh, yeah. like really mm. good. So I'm like, I really like his part in that, in uh, Aggro Girl. I, I won't lie to you, it's his performance in the dub is the reason I could never go back to the sub, because I just can't get over how fantastic and hilarious he sounds. Yeah, like he's just, that dude has some fucking pipes, and he's yeah, like, he brings really it every single time. It's really cool. And absolutely kills it, too. Uh, and it's interesting, actually, that this is the first season where they really, they actually drop the title Agretzko. Yes, I was like, yes. thank you. They, they worked it in. <laughs> this, this is the, the day, day Agretzko, Agretzko was, was born. born. And I'm like, fuck yes. <laughs> yes. I actually got chills from that. I was like, what? Ah, oh, damn. Yeah. Why, why did I catch feels there? Ooh. There's... There's a lot in this season that I was like, whoa, I'm getting emotionally moved by this. And, and scenes that otherwise I kind of felt were like, could have easily come off as cheesy or, oh, we're doing this just to kind of set something up. And I'm like, no, this is working. Yeah, there's there's a lot of things this season that feel like they could be contrived, like uh, Tadano's part and how he interconnects pretty much 
all of the little subplots together. Yeah. But he but he turns out to just be such a bro throughout that entire thing that's like, you can't be mad. No. Everyone loves the Tata bro. <laughs> Hell yeah. I like him. I thought he was great. <laughs> yeah, sweet little donkey boy. Oh. Uh, if sweet anybody follows... Elon Musk boy. <laughs> Yeah, it's, mm -hmm. oh, oh my god. Oh, we can go into Todd in a second, but if anybody's checked out my Twitter, I fixed the ending. Definitely check that out. <laughs> I I won't uh, lie. I'm going to be quite honest. The moment Tadano showed back up, I, the first thing I said was, now kiss! <laughs> and I literally <laughs> said that. I'm not even kidding. I actually asked my husband. Uh, of course, uh, Washimi and Gori still being absolutely awesome Yas queens. Yo, uh, Gori this season brought it. She was one of my yes. favorite performances the entire season. Just like soup, everything was just stand out great from her. Actually, I loved it. Actually, I want to mention, so all the side characters, This, this, I think the best part about this season in general is that it utilizes every single character who's on screen the perfect amount. Yeah. It was actually really impressive just how well it balanced all of its characters and only because they've already had two seasons to really stand out. So bringing them back in, they had to serve a purpose and every character did. And I was really impressed. I, yeah. Like with with Washimi and Gori, like they don't actually put them together a whole lot of this season. No. And they kind of get to stand on their own in different ways. And actually, I was a big fan of that. Seeing them together is always fun, but seeing them on their own, being their own people, is always and in, so and interesting. And interacting with, like, all the other supporting cast as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I like how it's sort of, like, it's leading to, like, Retsuko having, like, this kind of posse of people who just kind of all <laughs> know each other and have, have, have her back collectively. I just think that's kind of cool. Yeah. And then, of, co and then of course, there is... Uh, the ultimate B plot throughout this entire season, almost kind of hard to call it a B plot at times with how much I got invested in it. But fucking Haida and uh, Inui man, just oh. I need to know what you were feeling while going through that, because there were moments where I was watching it just like, come on, Haida, just God damn it. Choose yeah, the, make the right choice. Yeah. It's you know what? It's it's complicated because it's like. You know, we mentioned you mentioned the theme of this uh, earlier in the podcast. What I see the, the the ongoing theme is sort of doing what everybody else wants you to do versus doing what you want to do. Mm -hmm. And the, you'll notice that throughout this, there's this constant pressure from the other characters on him to date Inui. Where it's like, like, no, man, like Inui's great. What are you doing? Don't you want to have a good life? Go with hers. What? Why are you like even bothering with this stupid choice? And it's funny because it's kind of like it's Haida's turn to go through the same shit that Retsuko went through from the fan base on the first season, where everybody mm -hmm. was like, why aren't you dating the nice hyena boy? But he's so nice. You should go out with him. He would make you so happy. And she just doesn't. And people were like, you're dumb. What's wrong with you? Well, now it's Haida's turn because now it's like this. there's this great girl who shows up like out of nowhere and she's basically perfect for him. She has so much in common with him and she's so great. But despite that, he doesn't really look at her that way. That's just not who he's interested in. And he can't force himself to do that. And then mm. he tries and it's a disaster. So it's kind of like like when uh, uh, people were saying like, oh, Retsko, you got to go out with him. It's like, I'm kind of glad she didn't, because if she did, she would have been miserable with 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 Haida in season one. Like that's he you can you can clearly tell with Inui, he is putting on this show of like, oh yeah, no, we're totally simpatico and it's so great, hooray. And then as soon as she's like out of the room, he's like, oh God, if he actually went into a long-term relationship with her or God forbid married Inui, holy crap, that would be this really tragic relationship. I think he would eventually come to just resent her because she's not the girl he wanted and he feels stuck with her, even if she's great. So it's yeah. like, I feel like he actually weirdly made the right choice, not necessarily in pursuing Retsuko again, but into just like not continuing things with Inui because it just wasn't working because he wasn't into it. it takes two to tango, man, you know? Yeah, mm -hmm. I yeah. have to agree and, with and that. that. And that and that level of attraction is necessary. I mean, it's, it's obvious that on some level he was attracted to her. He obviously recognized, you know, she's awesome. I yeah. like hanging out with her and she's clearly, she's clearly a good person. Oh, yeah. But that's Going all we know, you know? I mean, yeah. not to get a little too far off topic, but um, 
there are a lot of guys who will say things like, I'm such a nice guy, why can't mm. I, you know, get with a girl that I like, that kind of thing. Nice is not a personality. Nice mm. is an underlying condition. You know, you can be nice and have a great sense of humor, nice and be really smart, but just being nice isn't really enough. And unfortunately, at least as far as we see from Inui, that's really all we know about her is she's nice and also she can cook and she likes uh, uh, punk rock, which is, that's kind of neat. But like, he doesn't really learn anything more about her and he doesn't really see who she is underneath like all of this, all of the, the nice. And so that's why like, as, as an audience, we see her, we go, she's so nice, but we don't really know anything about her. She doesn't really actually get a lot of development. So that's kind of why I, I'm I'm okay with him just being like, yeah, she's nice, but uh, because that's how I think most people would be. I think that's, and you're right. And I think the reason that people get uh, as frustrated or as at least, I think most people I, generally are just sort of sad for Inui. I don't think they're necessarily saying, man, Haida, what the fuck are you doing? Oh, there's been um, plenty of people who did. Oh, yeah. No, no. I, I 100% uh, am sure there are a lot of people who are saying that uh, Haida was an idiot and should have gone with Inui. I yeah. think Haida is an idiot for other reasons. Oh, yeah. But not for not going with Inui. <laughs> um, but ultimately, uh, I think the reason that people are, are generally sad for Inui is that she was more emotionally mature than both Retsuko and Haida in that situation. Oh, God, she, yeah. Yeah, she went out of her way. I won't lie. That moment where her eyes narrow at Haida when he says, Oof. I would have chosen you. Like, yeah. it, here, the thing I want to bring up about that line, by the way, is that it means the both. It, it means the same thing in both versions. You just, in the English version, he avoids saying the full stupid thing that he said. In the yeah. Japanese version, when he says, I'm sorry, it's not, I'm sorry, I... Uh, I ultimately didn't choose you it was i'm sorry i said that yeah, yeah i'm sorry i'm sorry i lied because yeah. she saw she saw it for what it was right yeah. you already know where his heart lies it's just such a, a a painfully relatable situation yeah i, I feel like a lot of people can like, have been in the situation where it's like look i i have feelings for this person but this other person just came into my life and i, I feel like something could work there but my heart just isn't there if the yeah. situation was different and my heart was in a place where it could be there, maybe things could be good. But I, uh, it can't I've actually be. experienced like something in my own personal dating life very similar mm -hmm. to what Haida goes through with Inui, which is that I tried to like make it work with a person who I think like underneath everything I knew just wasn't right for me. And I, I don't think I treated her very well. If I'm being, if I'm being very uh, frank, like I, I remember just kind of instead of like just telling her, hey, I don't think this is working. I just kind of got like distant from her and just kind of hoped that she would break it off. It was like really, really immature of me and really shitty. And like I still think back on that, on how I treated her, and I go, wow, what the fuck was wrong with me? And that's kind of what Haida's doing, where he's just sort of like trying to make this thing work because everybody tells him this is the right move and and he tries and he thinks maybe it'll work and he's just like what am i doing this sucks and so if she kind of does him a favor by by like calling him out on his bs and like oh, walking yeah. away <laughs> yeah and i i really loved that i love the fact that she just goes up there and she's like okay yo um if you can't read the writing on the wall then i'm just gonna make this decision for us yeah well, she's, I mean, hey, that's, that's, that's very in character because she was making all the decisions the whole time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, oh, you no, know what she no, made? I'm, I'm in charge. No, you're not, Haida, sweetie. Shut the fuck up. You have no idea what you're doing. Like, she's making all the moves. God. Mm. <laughs> yep. And that's, and that's it. That's, that's why, you know, like people are sad for Inui and they're frustrated with Haida. But yeah. at least, at the very fucking least... You know, Haida didn't drag it out too long. I mean, yeah. he he did he didn't lead her on, like, for too long. Like th no. there there was a part, and and it wasn't even really leading on. It was it was it's like that moment in the show, uh, says you, you have to make the decision. Like you can do what you want. We aren't in we aren't in something committed yet. So yeah. you still have to make your choice. Yeah. yeah. Um. But before. So ultimately, I feel like this conversation sort of leads into the ending, and I do want to talk about some other things. And yes. one character, there's a character that I'd really like to talk about because I thought I was going to hate her, and then I ended up hmm. loving her. Yeah. Are we, ta are we talking about Manaka? We're Monica. talking about Manaka. Yes. Yeah, she's. Uh, th this show has such a beautiful way of taking characters that you're like, you initially hate, and then making them so lovable and relatable, or at the very least relatable in some way, in, in regards to like tone. 
Yeah, yeah. like she's like, she, she goes from Gummy's new girl to I will protect you, new girl. And you're like, fuck, okay. <laughs> yeah, Monica, Monica is a bitch. But she isn't cruel. She She's isn't, a well-written bitch. That's yeah, what she is. She is. She understands what it takes to get where she wants to get in that business, and she's going to do it. But she's not going to treat people like garbage or shit to do it. And that she the, also does. She doesn't have the practical knowledge for it. She ha, she has a knack for it. She knows how to do the performing side, but she doesn't know anything about the logistical side. Which is where Hyoto comes in and is like, look, we need to drop a nuke. We we cannot just be another grain of sand. We've got to really make people take notice. Mm-hmm. And that's that was so interesting. And and the fact that she, you know, at first she pushes back. She's like, no, this is obviously not going to work. Okay, maybe not. Okay, wow. Uh, I have to rethink how I'm going about this. And that was so fascinating because they could have easily gone down the route of, I have to sabotage her. I have to fuck up everything she's doing because she's better than me and I'm jealous. And no, she realizes like, no, this is the business and I have to adapt and I have to do what I have to do. And that's really, really interesting. I like when they when she admits that she's 26. I mean, of course, my, my wife, when she says, like, I'm old, I'm 26, my wife just, like, flipped off the screen instinctively. Uh, but, like, yeah. But it's, like, that kind of thing of, you know, this, this person who's like, yeah, I don't give a shit. I'm chasing my dreams, and I'm going to do whatever the hell I have to do to succeed. And, like, that's that's really why she is the way she is. She's not just, like, mean because she's just a mean girl for no reason as a poorly written 2D character. She's just very, very driven. And it's yep. like, I really like that kind of quality rather than just keeping it some stereotype. Yeah. And when Resco and when Resco is introduced to the group, she's she's not introduced with any form of authority. So Manaka treats her as such. Yeah. Uh, she's she's introduced as essentially like a toady that's there to carry stuff around and a, a gopher, basically. Mm-hmm. So being the head of this pop idol group, even if it has a, a relatively small following of maybe like 12 people and one overly zealous fan uh, <laughs> they she treats Retzko poorly until Retzko kind of starts showing that she really does have a lot of value to add to this team because yeah. OTM girls wasn't OTM girls until Retzko made it work yeah like she she found all the practical parts that made it so that they could actually be successful you know can I, can promote, I just say yeah, promote your I shows. love the fact that what they did was they worked in Retzko's actual job into like her her practicality with this group where it's yes. like instead of just like oh we're just gonna make you suddenly have a good idea she's like wait a minute no I'm a fucking good ass accountant I know how mm-hmm. to work, handle money and and she uses her all of the skills that she's learned at her actual job to like fix this group because she really does know what she's doing when she applies herself and it's it's kind of like nice to see her sort of empowered for once yeah i have to agree absolutely like watching her actually adapt that business with all the practical knowledge that she's learned over the years okay i won't lie this season hit really close to home because for the last 12 years nick myself and everyone at team four star have been busting our asses to make a business we've had to learn a lot of things the hard way it's been the school of hard knocks ground up and watching her come in and be like no this is impractical and you're not thinking right i'm like yeah yeah that happens you get so you you get into your business and you think oh no i I know what i'm doing and then somebody with practical knowledge comes in and they're like no you idiot you absolute (laughs) fool let me let me solve this complicated problem easily and it's, and it's great like, oh, because wow. <laughs> like when like at first you like like you were talking about Hyoto originally right like he comes across mm-hmm. as this like i'm in charge and it turns out he really doesn't know what the fuck he's actually doing he hurts no. his neck because he's yeah, head he, banging he, 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 he like fucks <clears throat> up the whole like he, he buys too much merch that they can't sell yep. he like fucking pisses off like the promoters and like you're like oh my god no wonder this thing sucks this guy who you think is a total badass is actually completely fucking incompetent yep. and once she realizes that shit and and like shows him up and he just kind of like backs down and goes Oh, uh, uh, okay. And just kind of lets her do her thing. And it's like, yes, fucking go, girl. Awesome. 
And it's so the biggest message to that, and one of the most relatable things to that, at least in our situation, is as you add more people to the team, they bring new experiences with them. He he knew what he was doing in some regards when it came to producing the music and knowing what they needed to like get fans to react. That's he true. knew that, but he didn't know anything about the logistical side of. Uh, okay, so how, how do I save money on merch? How do I make sure that we're getting booked in the right places? Yeah. Which is something that Retsco could provide for. Mm -hmm. And th that's what kind of like completed the team. And it was so, uh, again, like th this whole relatability of this to our lives was certainly part and parcel to why this is my favorite season. <laughs> even though it, even though this particular adventure of Let's Go's is unrelatable for so many others. Uh, very relatable like, for a yeah. creative. It, I mean, oh yeah, if you're if you're a performance artist, hi, I'm a performance artist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is really super relatable. Yeah. So like, no, I but I feel like it, even though the situation is not very relatable, I don't think very many people, you know, know anything about like fan interactions and like trying to be a celebrity or something, but like the ex the things that she goes through are all stuff I think everybody's had to deal with. Like, continuing from where uh, uh, Hyodo basically screws things up with the promoter and makes her go get the money, that mm -hmm. scene, for me, hurts the hardest out of everything in it. Where she's, like, on her knees begging and he's, like, raining fucking money down on her like she's a stripper. And it's, like, fucking God, that feeling of just being, like, completely degraded because you feel like you have no choice. That, to me, just kind of like, that's like, yeah, I feel like everybody has been through something like that, regardless of whether you're trying to be an idol or not. Which led into uh, probably like the first holy shit moment of the season, which yeah. was fuck you, capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Screw you, capitalism! And that fucking song, jail cell, no door! I'm like, god damn. Damn, so... that, that's one of my favorite ones. I mean, so topical. I mean, I, I, at the same time, you know, screw you, capitalism. By the way, this show was made by the people who uh, made Hello yeah. Kitty, which is one of the most popular, uh, you know, multimedia franchises in all of Japan and yes, across and it's the world. airing on Netflix. Yeah. One of the most popular mm -hmm. streaming services. Yeah. yeah. That, that, like, yeah. <laughs> like, look, I, am, I wholly believe that Radeko, Radecho, whatever, and his wife believe in the things that they're trying to talk about here. I, oh, I, yeah. I believe in that. But <laughs> this is Sanrio. It's, it's, Capitalism it's, 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 makes it's their all, whole thing fucking to be, run. To be fair, though, you know something? You know what I have not seen from Sanrio? Some freaking merch for this oh. show, which is ironic because it's like, you know, this is technically created to sell merchandise. And like, I can't find any unless it's like at the Sanrio store. Yeah, it's San, bonkers. Like, but the one in fucking <laughs> J-Town in Los Angeles? Yeah, they, they've got a Sanrio store, and I showed up there, and I'm like, okay, bunch of Gretzko stuff, barely any Fenico. Where's the Where's the Haida stuff? Where's any of the side characters? There's Washimi and Gori, which they're mm -hmm. awesome, but yeah. where's like I literally could not find any Haida merch. I wanted Haida merch, dude. I had to, you know, because we're in a pandemic, and we all try to wear masks, especially here in uh, uh, mm -hmm. Southern California. But um, like, I had to, I like made one. I have like a hide a mask that I actually had to make because they just don't exist. So I was like, All right, <laughs> I'm gonna do it. I'm I'm sorry, Sanrio. I didn't mean to bootleg you, but like, hey, I took a I took a screenshot from the show. Does that count? And I'm not selling it. But yeah, <laughs> I wish they kind of had more merch of like everybody. I want to I want a fucking Fenico plushie. Just my favorite. Too. Yes. Like I, I, a friend got me a birthday gift, and it was one of the few Fenico pieces of merch they made, and I fucking have it in my office. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Fenico, Fenico, Fenico is, by the way, Fenico being one of my favorite your characters. Girl. Yeah. Yeah, Fenico, oh my god. Uh, by the way, I love, <laughs> Fenico gets a decent amount of screen time this season, which yes. I, I'm honest, honest to god, she needs to have a decent amount of screen time every season. She's one of the mm. best characters, and she always adds a great amount of depth. I also love the fact that Haida finally calls her out on her exact behavior type of, I think yes. I'm too cool for this, and then falls in love with it. Uh -huh. I'm, I'm more than happy to see her get called out on that because it's three. we're three seasons in. Let's start breaking her down. Yep. Um, <laughs> but her her involvement this season, I love the fact that she gets into the sexy unicorn. Yes. Oh, God, for me. So, like, um, for those of you guys who don't know uh, Caitlin, who is the, uh, the voice of uh, Fenico, if you want to know what she's like as a person, think Fenico's personality with, like, a dimmer switch. 
basically. <laughs> like, like just sort of like, okay, I'm going to be nice to you. And yes, I, okay. But, oh, oh, okay. All right. You know what? That's it. Full Fenico. That's Caitlyn. <laughs> and so whenever That's like great. I see the character, I just picture Caitlyn doing everything that Fenico's doing, like wearing a stupid VR helmet and going, oh, damn. Oh, damn. Kyle, her husband. Kyle, you're obsolete. I got, I got a new boyfriend. Get the hell out of here. That's just, I don't know. It, it just, everything she says cracks me up this season, and it's it, the character itself is just amazing. Oh. She's, she's always been incredibly top tier. Ever since, ever since her like first monotone, ha 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 ha, laugh in season one. I'm just like, all right, best girl. I'm, I'm in. Yes. Keep going. So the purest I'm, of trolls. So, um. Before we, we're, we're, we're getting close to that hour mark, and we might go over or not, but just to make sure, there's, so yeah, we've, we've talked I'm, about, I'm, huh? I, I was, I was going to wrap back into uh, what we were talking about on, uh, you know, go, going through with like fan interactions. Yes, oh, which okay, that of, was literally uh, yeah, where I was about to go, yeah. so. A lot, a lot of people, completely unrelatable, like, you know, it's, it's not something people deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. But sometimes you do run into that person that is like overzealous and just like a little too into what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And oh boy, does this show take a sharp right turn uh, yeah. into yeah. creepy territory when they introduce the stalker who drops down that like that little ticket brochure that they were having for like little handshake meet and greets for shaking Agretzko's hand for five minutes and just berating her for ruining what he believed to be an amazing idol group. Yeah. I want to... So, Ooh. he doesn't have a name. Uh, he's no. just Unhinged um, Fan. Yeah, yeah that's Unhinged Fan or Stalker or whatever you want to go uh, mm -hmm. with. Um, but... Uh, and just a... It's, he's a llama, which, you know, that's... Drama llama. Yeah, drama llama. Oh, um, I like it. He is... The moment he showed up, I got immediately incredibly uncomfortable because I knew exactly what was going on. Yeah, but at least he's responsible and wears a mask. Oh my god, <laughs> right? Uh, that's. <laughs> but yeah, he he shows up and he plops down those tickets, and I wasn't actually ready for it to go the uh, the direction that it went, but I knew immediately like, oh, this guy's not bad news. This guy is going to be way, way, way too into her. And then as I found out, I was like, no, he's into the OTM girls. He fucking hates her. Yeah. And that, that, I mean, ooh, I got immediately incredibly, utterly uncomfortable mm -hmm. because, you know, and, and again, this may, I, I, there's a difference between sympathy and empathy. I empathized in that moment greatly because there have been moments, you know, you know, over the last 12 years, as we've built team four star, there are people who fucking hate me and love the rest of the team. And wow. it goes for a lot of the other members in the team, too. Everybody, you know, there are a bunch of people who are like, oh, this I'm, would be I'm so much... I'm pretty sure I'm universally loved. Yes. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> um, and, but in that moment where he starts going, berating her and treating her like shit and treating her like she's ruining this, you know, group, I, I kind of had to take a moment because it's a really, really gross and uncomfortable scene. And... Yeah. Four uh, minutes that... and 30 seconds left. Yeah. <laughs> it's like 30 seconds, huh? And, and Four and a half minutes to go. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. And, and God. that, yeah, he's a, who, that, that, I don't know how to really describe to you just like the kind of anxiety that scene gave me. <laughs> it's yeah. just, it's just such a, like, creepily like somewhat relatable position for people that have gone to like conventions and have had people that uh, maybe follow you a little too much and you start thinking yeah. okay what's going through their minds it's it's unnerving especially when it goes like way past the point of no return with that ending you mm. the moment you see the box cutter click 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 out i'm just like oh <clears throat> shit they're going there yeah, yeah. And they went exactly there, too. I thought it was going to be like one of those, you know, he comes up there and cuts her clothes, which some stalkers or creeps in Japan do. But no, he was flat out going to take her out. And I was like, yep. oh, OK, yeah, that happens also. <laughs> that That's a thing that happens in Japan with, yep, you know, shut-ins with ki hikikimoris who, like, because they're, I want to talk a little bit about this. There are a lot of people, uh, not just in Japan, but worldwide, uh, world over, who get really obsessed with the things that they love. Yep. Mm. To the point where they start to value it as their own. 
Yeah, and, and, and this guy is very specifically because he was essentially running the unofficial official fan account for uh, OTM Girls, yeah. and then he had that taken away from him, and then this new girl came in and changed everything about what they were, and all of a sudden, everything changed, and like it, it just fucked his worldview. Yeah. yeah, it's it's like from his perspective, he was being cut out, so to speak. So he's like, I'm going to cut you out. It's like yep. literally though, but like <laughs> everything that he invested himself in was being changed and he had a face to put his hatred to. And that's mm -hmm. why that's why it is uh, to get a little bit personal over the last, you know, year and a half. It's been really tough to kind of struggle with people like that, with people who think, no, this was mine and you fucked it up. You ruined it. And I won't go too far into details, but yeah, it's it sucks there, to there, hear it's, a, it sucks to hear it just a, there's online. been a few there's been a few nasty messages here and there. Yeah. I mean I I, I get them weekly. And yeah. it's really fucked up to see this scene. And they, they portray it as exactly as, as scary and as fucked up as it is. And I'm really glad that the show didn't cut corners. Like the show mm. could have played it down a little bit, but they, they played it exactly as it is and yeah, yeah, Laura no, Bailey says hi. <laughs> oh my god. Hi, Laura. Yeah. Well, no, I mean because of uh uh her experience with The Last of mm -hmm. Us too. Yeah. 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 No, people Absolutely. people treated Laura Bailey like shit because she voiced a character that upset a bunch of people, and that's unacceptable. Yeah. Like, and luckily, I think I think most of us know that that is fucked up, but the people no. who don't need to hear it louder. Yeah. There are seriously. people that don't understand the difference between fantasy and reality. And like just Think about all the shit. Uh, I can't remember the actor's name, but the kid that played uh, the like oh god, I can't oh Joffrey remember. characters Joffrey, yeah, kid that played oh, Joffrey yeah. got yeah. When he's like you know he's he's still just a kid playing a character that's an absolute bastard very well, so well that people literally hate him and wanted him dead, which is a little bit messed up for a child. Yes, yeah, very much so. Um, oh yeah, it's, Kelly Marie Tran. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, Le left from social media because of the backlash that her like that the Last Jedi was getting. The people <laughs> pinned squarely on her as like the one new character. Yeah, it's like super messed up. Yeah. Ugh. But yeah, Ooh. no, they. I'm I'm glad that they took it seriously uh, with that, and they didn't. Uh, by the way, I do think it's kind of interesting. I don't know if they did it for some particular reason, but like. When uh, earlier in the season, when Haida like sees them in concert and realizes, oh, I guess Retsuko is actually not you know being sold for money, uh, he's like, oh, I guess I should just leave. And he bumps into somebody. And he goes, oh, sorry, and he leaves. And the guy mm -hmm. he bumps into is that unhinged fan. Yeah. Yep. And I'm like, oh, it's like a little setup. And I, I like I like little details like that. Yeah, no, that was great. And and the the in, I, that was such a great way to introduce that character because. Um, when he pops back up again, you're like, oh, dude, that's the guy with the patch. Oh, right. no. <laughs> it's oh, no, like that's that, the uh, guy with the patch. You guys remember uh, Too Many Cooks? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like that, where you, like, you start realizing, oh, shit, the killer has been there this whole time. Oh, God, it's like really unnerving, and I like that kind of stuff. It's really creepy, just, like, just starts getting creepier and creepier until it finally goes full hog in the second to last episode. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh... Yeah, super high to jumping in there to save the day while this guy gets pinned down and arrested and hopefully ultimately taken away forever. Right. <laughs> I guess I guess we'll find out potentially in season four because we do get what amounts to essentially an evergreen ending here where if I it's 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 sort of satisfactory. But the other side's like, I, I don't know, there's like still a lot to answer for here. And also, like, did Agretzico have to leave her other life with that? I can understand why she did. It's mm. like, yeah, I think it's time we talk about the ending. Yes, oh, yeah. it is time to talk about episode the 10 of season four or three. Blah, 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 blah. But yeah, yeah, epi yeah, episode negative one of season four. Yeah. <laughs> well, so um, I'm, I'm just going to be upfront about it. I like the story this, I generally actually kind of like the overall story that this episode was trying to tell, but the pacing of which it did it fucks the story up a lot. It felt like it needed two episodes. Yes. This felt like it needed two episodes yeah. to properly allow it to breathe and build because mm. the way that it actually ends up it, it, like evolving, it's like, okay, we need to like wrap this up now and get all this stuff out of the way. And it makes certain characters look worse than they should. 
Yeah. And I think I know which character you're talking about. But, oh, really? Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, so, uh, when we were going to record, uh, the ending for this, um, uh, you know, because this, this whole season was recorded from home, I basically just got a big, uh, Google Sheets document that was constantly being updated with the dialogue. So I could at least have some kind of idea of what was going to happen. It was just the dialogue, so there was no visuals to go along with it. And By the way, that's really was... cool to hear. I didn't know that's how that yeah. worked. Oh, for, for the work from home stuff, that's how they were doing it. But, oh, uh, normally, okay. Normally I wouldn't have gotten to see any of this stuff. Oh, that's, okay, so that's new. That's why I, okay, cool. Yes. Um, and so we were, uh, they were, they were sending, they sent me the script and I was, I was just kind of, I was like, I, I don't want to read ahead, but I kind of want to know, but I don't, but I do, but I don't, but I do. But then I finally, I started reading through it and I was like, okay, am I just missing something here? Or do they just yell at each other? And then the show ends. Like, <laughs> what the fuck? And so we recorded this, this scene and, and, um, we, we also recorded it kind of piecemealy. Um, so like we didn't, I didn't get to see the final, final scene between the two of them just the stuff leading up to the song and then we did another session like a week later which was just me like for a week going what the fuck is happening uh, um, <laughs> uh and then finally we recorded the song and then did some pickups um and then did the final scene and so when we were recording the song i said to, to patrick i said listen i i have a question for you are we supposed to just hate Haida now is that where the show is going <laughs> Like, is he supposed to be, like, a bad guy, like this douchebag, incel, awful person who we're supposed to hate? And um, what what Patrick said to me was, like, look, no, it's not that. It's that Haida's basically trying to use some tough love to help out Retzko. Because, uh, but, like, the song, I mean, is not nice at all. No. It is, he, he does not, even in Japanese, uh, people pointed this out online, like, well, he's not really saying... It sounds chicken to me. He's not calling her a chicken, but what he is doing is he's basically, like, sarcastically mocking like how her life is. So like, and either way, he's not oh, being nice. Oh, poor to her. you! Almost got killed. Ugh, yeah, cry about it. <laughs> yeah, that's basically what he's doing, and it's like really fucking mean and super insensitive. And so, you know, I, my personal feelings are, and and again, you know, a lot of this is. When you watch a show that has really relatable characters, it's very, very easy to just straight up project yourself onto yeah. them. Mm -hmm. And like for me personally, when I deal with something that is either tragic or, or traumatic or something just really painful, uh, what works for me doesn't necessarily work for other people. Like some people need, uh, I don't know, therapy. They need to see a professional therapist. That's, that, that's somebody to guide them through their emotions and help them through to the end. Some people need to just be surrounded by friends and family so they don't feel alone. And some people, like me, I need everybody to just leave me the hell alone. I need everybody to just get away from me because I'm my own best therapist. Um, this is a little TMI, but I'll, I'll, I'll go into it anyway. Um, Please uh, do. This past uh, May, uh, late May, uh, my dog's uh, chronic spinal condition uh, was becoming uh, too severe. He was he basically has herniated discs and they were mm. pushing into his spinal cord and affecting his ability to walk. And it was getting worse and worse and worse. And I was in denial of, I don't want to lose my doggy. I love my dog. Mm. Um, but I couldn't pull that trigger to put him down. So uh, my wife wound up, uh, she, she had a family emergency and she left to go spend time with her with her folks. And I was like, okay, now that I'm alone, I'm going to do this. And so I had to, I, I got a, a, a guy who was very, very good. He, he wore a hazmat suit, so there was no danger of transmission. And uh, he came to my house and euthanized my dog and put him down. And um, it fucked me up. Um, mm. uh, I have never had to put an animal down in my life, ever. Aww. And uh, it really, really sucked. And, um, but if you look at my, say, uh, my social media presence uh, at that time, I'm just kind of quiet. I mentioned yeah. nothing about it. And it's because I don't feel good when people pity me, when mm -hmm. people reach out and say, I heard your, what you went through, and I just wanted to say I'm so sorry. That just makes me feel super self-conscious, and I hate it. So the yeah. reason I waited for my wife to be gone was so that I would not have anybody there, and I could just sit there and heal and process and just, my, my feelings. Yeah, just just live in that somber yeah. bubble of grief for a moment because it, it's something mm -hmm. that a lot of people don't take time to absorb there's yeah th there's a a kind of tragic beauty to that level of like grief sort of yeah but yeah it sucked but it was what i needed 
It was mm. that's that's how I process. I'm my own best therapist. Therapy does mm. not help me at all. So mm. when I watched this scene, and I'm like, okay, Haida basically drags her to karaoke, and then just starts telling her how to live, and then just starts making fun of her. I'm like, wow, what a fucking asshole. What the hell is wrong with this? And that was my. That's that that was my gut reaction to this. So when people with the discourse online, I see that and I go, you know what? I get it. I I feel you. How how this feels like rushed and it feels inappropriate and it's terrible. Um, but so I had what I would encourage anybody who has a problem with this ending to do, is do what I did, which is take a step back. You know, um, realize that despite the fact that the characters in this show are super relatable, you're not those characters. Those characters have their own defined personalities. They have their own strengths, their own weaknesses. And ultimately what this show does very well is it just takes the characters, develops them, and then just kind of puts them together in a scene and lets them be themselves and sort of see what happens. Mm. So the moral of this story is not, in my opinion, oh, it's a really good idea to be a toxic person and yell at somebody who's been through a traumatic situation that's not the goal and then let's reward them somehow like that's not what it is what it is is you have to look at who the characters are so in this case you have gori you have washimi you have haida technically fenico's there too but she's just kind of tagging along and then you have retsuko herself and the way i view the characters is is this um pretend like uh you're you're dealing with something like your television breaks you you, you can't power it on for some reason so you, you call over these three people uh, Washimi, she's your she's your intellectual friend, right? She's the one who says, okay, the TV's broken. Well, here's what we should do. We should take it to a repair shop or we should uh, uh, just buy you a new one. And then you ask Gori, what, what should I do? And Gori, she's her, she, she's your, your fun, emotionally supportive friend. And so what she says is she says, no, 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 no. Let's just open it up and see if maybe there's some obvious problem and we can fix it and turn it into a project because I believe in us. That's Gori. Haida is your stupid fucking boyfriend who goes, ladies, 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 why don't you let a man handle this? And everybody goes, oh, Jesus Christ, Haida, what are you doing? And he goes, hang on, hang on. I just binged me a whole season of this little show known as Happy Days. I know how to fix this. <laughs> oh, no. All you got to do, put on a cool leather jacket, slap it, and go, eee, and it'll work. And they're like, you are the dumbest person. He's like, too late, already got the jacket on. And he smacks the TV and goes, eee, and somehow... Despite the fact that it's the stupidest idea, it manages, the TV turns on. And everybody goes, I can't believe this fucking idiot had the dumbest idea ever and it somehow worked. That's basically who the characters are. Retzko yeah. is a flawed person. She is, she, and that's not a, a criticism, like flawed people I think are interesting characters. Mm. One of the things that the show does super well is that it establishes these flaws in subtle ways without just directly stating it. Like there's the obvious one, which is, uh, she has anger issues. Like, okay, yeah, duh. But there's also things that she consistently does where she undervalues herself, she does not reach out for help, and she also sucks ass at fixing herself. She has, con like, every single good idea that has helped her has either come from someone else or through someone else's encouragement or sometimes, like, in the case of, like, the yoga instructor in season one, just straight up grabbing her and saying, you're gonna do this, and just, like, forcing her to do it. Haida has also some serious problems too. He has flaws and one of his flaws, he has, first of all, he has jealousy. That one's really obvious. But then the other one is the fact that Haida has this kind of, this kind of hero complex where he's got to, he's got to save the girl. He's got to, he's got to jump in and do what's necessary, even though he really is kind of an idiot. He doesn't know mm -hmm. what he's doing. He's, he's emotionally not too swift and he wears his emotions on his sleeve. When he's like jealous, he's just fucking jealous and that's it. And like, and he just, he makes it really clear and, and that's sort of who he is. So it takes these two flawed characters and it puts them in the scene together and it shows them trying to fix each other, basically, where he calls her out on her bullshit and then she straight up calls him out on his. And that's why it works. It works because Retzko is not the type of person who gets hurt and then gets sad and quiet and needs space. Retzko is the one who gets fucking angry and needs to go vent in, in a karaoke booth and scream at the top of her fucking lungs. That's who she is. And so what she's doing when she's at her mom's place, she's not healing. 
She's not taking time to get better, for Christ's sake. She's living with her fucking mother, a woman who is a constant source of stress. She ain't healing over there. You even look at her face when, when he opens up the door. She just has this blank expression, just sort of staring at her phone in this mostly empty room like a zombie. She is not healing at all. Yeah, she's hiding. What she, what, exactly. She's hiding. She's pushing everybody away, which is something that she does. That is a thing that they've established. She doesn't accept help. She doesn't look for help. She pushes people away, even people who want to help her. She's just like, oh, no, no, I've got this, right? Wow, that looks like a lot of paperwork. Need some help? This is fine. That's what she does. And so what Haida does, Haida is the one who is most aware of this because when you watch somebody at work for five fucking years trying to fix their own problems and failing miserably, you see a pattern. And that's what Haida sees. That's why he's like, no, I'm not going to sit here and wait for her to start feeling better. Her life is going to be fucked. She's going to lose her entire job. She's going to lose her friends. And she's going to be a shut-in for the rest of her life if we don't do something. I don't know what to do. I'm not smart. I'm not emotionally intelligent. But I'm going to do fucking something, anything. And that's why he bursts in there, grabs her, pulls her off to the karaoke room, and starts trying to encourage her. And then she says, like, don't you get it? You're just forcing your feelings onto me. That's not how this works. That doesn't make me feel better. And then he just doesn't know what else to do. So he just says, fuck it. I'm just going to call you out on, on, your, on what you're doing and how poorly you're handling this. And then she's like, oh, you think you're so brave? Yeah, you're just, you're only brave because like my stupid friend's app made you confident. And she tries to cut into him. But in doing so, she's herself, finally. Mm -hmm. Which is, she hasn't gotten to rage as herself like for herself in so long it's it's been commercialized this thing that was her security blanket was mm. taken away from her and and made public with a spotlight on it so finally she actually feels like herself and that's why at the end of it he isn't like like hurt that like the girl that he has this mad crush for basically calls him an idiot and tells him to leave her the hell alone he's happy because she's finally standing up for herself and being herself and that's what actually snaps her out of it so it's not Haida saving her. Haida doesn't save her. Haida's an idiot and his ideas are stupid. <laughs> Retsuko saves herself through him. And that's, that's why the ending actually does work to me. That's actually a really cool way of like looking at it. I didn't think about it from the perspective of her thing that was hers, like private and personal, was commercialized and therefore like robbed from her. Uh, I looked at it like as her like being able to find like be herself on stage, but uh, the way you described it there, that makes so much more sense is in terms of like how she reacted and how she was able to like how that ending is justified in her coming back the way she did. Very well put. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. I Oh, and by the way, just I, I do want to. I'm sure I'm sure I, you've had a lot of time to think about it. I have. But also, I just want a quick PSA to anybody who's listening. Uh, just FYI, this only works because of who Retzko is. If you know somebody who is going through a traumatic situation, yes. don't fucking do what Haida did. That's not a good idea. Just yeah. like most of the time, it's pretty much horrible. And but also, that's a last resort very thing. easy Thank to you. point out. Also, very easy to point out, this is still a work of fiction. Uh, True that. It's yeah. a cartoon there, show. There's, actually, there's funny animals. Actually, <laughs> I'd like to chime in on that. Um, I think everything you said, everything that you just laid out and, and explained, fantastic. And generally, I agree with basically every bit of that. I, then, and, and this is not a refutation of your point, but no I think the reason that it ultimately... I'm not going to say didn't work, but has hit different for hit so differently for different people is that because they had to get it done in 15 minutes yeah there were a lot of emotional it, it beats still feels that rushed the no matter what would, you do yeah huh what, what it was still that, feels sorry? rushed no matter what you do at that yeah. point i felt yeah. like there were a lot of emotional beats and explanations that the show otherwise was rather decent at giving that were sort of skipped over here we their lot was kind yeah. of left up to uh the audience's interpretation and well, sometimes it's a lot of say not it's a lot of telling not showing like we're mm. told that she might lose her job we're told that she's just holed up in her parents place but we don't necessarily have a good sense of time exactly from that. so yeah it looks like he just like went nope she she uh went to her mom's house for like two hours i'm gonna go grab her yeah. or maybe she was there for months we don't really exactly know what happened so exactly. it does feel kind of rushed yeah we don't have an idea of the amount of time that's passed the severity of her situation we're just kind of plopped into uh washimi and gori telling us the details very offhandedly 
Like, they're not yeah. things that are focused on heavily. They're just kind of said. And Haida's response to that is like, oh, shit. Well, that sucks. We got to do go, something. Yeah, let's go. Yeah, let's go. Let's, yeah. let's go grab her and just, just try to snap her out of it. Yeah. Mm. And that was the biggest issue. Like, if you lay, if this were something that were over the course, if, if the, uh, if they cut out all of the stuff with the, uh, or not cut it out, but if the episode had been dedicated entirely to showing Retsuko's state of mind and where she was at yes. mentally, I think we, this could have really worked. I think it could have yeah. been a very effective ending. But the fact that they weren't able to do that left this ending feeling rushed and frustrating and made Haida look like an asshole. Yeah. Which, you know what they could have done? Honestly, if hmm. they didn't want to extend it too long, they could have just had a scene with Retsuko and her mother of just like of like them at her home showing Retsuko's mental state of being like clearly not OK and not getting better. That's and, really and all they would then have. Ha and then having everybody else show up and being like, hey, boom, yeah, what's up? Yeah. We're your friends, uh, that, and we're here to save your ass, even though you don't reach out like you should. That definitely would have gone a long way to yeah, make, making the ending, like, a little bit more, uh, I, I don't want to say palatable, but make a bit more sense in some directions. Just letting us know exactly where uh, Retzko mm. is yeah. in terms of, you know, what she's been processing. and uh, But this desire to get back to an evergreen scenario where, you know, if, you know, if, you, if you're going to boot up a season four, you kind of need to start it where this last one left off. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, even though everybody's kind of had their own journey on the way, you need to kind of start from relatively the same plane and then expand from there again. Though uh, I, I will say this. I like uh, the very, very ending with the two of mm -hmm. them walking off together. Yeah. Because I, uh, um, I don't personally, I don't think that they're a couple. I don't think that's what happened. Mm -hmm. What I think happened is Retzko now looks at Haida after they basically blew off steam with each other as being an actual friend, not that friend at work that you talk to and then you don't really talk to him after work, but like an actual real part of her support network. Yeah. And so like I'm like, that that to me is uplifting. It's like, that's cool. And I like that because I, if they like w started going out like after this, I'd be like, that's like fucking whiplash. That way, that makes yeah. no sense. Agreed. And, and honestly, I'd be like, oh God, that relationship is going to just, just fall apart because now it's like, he's like her security blanket or some weird ass crap. And But I... I'm okay with them being true friends. I consider that enough progress. Yeah. It's very clear that the both of them still have much growing left to do, uh, which which I do hope they yeah. expand on in further seasons because I would love, love, love more of this show. Yes. Oh, yeah. I, I, and, I would suspect that if they were ending at season three, that we would have heard of that by now. I'm sure we'll get our season four. I, I, I suspect that we're probably going to get about five seasons total, although I, I guess I wouldn't be too surprised if, if season four were the end. Well, it's it's hard yeah. to say, and only the future can really. The future, like, uh, yeah. Only it's the future unwritten. knows. Yeah, yeah. The um, future that is forever out of reach. Uh, <laughs> but we have, we have uh, talked at plenty about this, Ben. I want to thank you very much for joining us yeah, here. Yeah, thank you, you so much. A lot of very, thank you for, very thank interesting you for giving me a, a platform to just like air out my feelings about the finale. Hell I'm like, yeah, I can't dude. fit this on Twitter. I see people hell saying, yeah. but I'm like, what, how the hell am I supposed to say this in 280 characters or less? I uh, know. <laughs> honestly, any, any time, hearing dude, your perspective like, on this was in, not only incredibly informative just from your perspective, but actually really gave me a lot to think about with the ending. I was, my mind's been going back and forth on it. So I really loved your breakdown, man. Well, thanks. And further, uh, just in, in terms of, you know, speaking of the platform, is there anything that you'd like to tell the people here? Like anything you want to plug, things coming up, things that you want people to check out? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, let's see. Um, so we are going to be doing um, an Agretzko live panel. It's going to be uh, streamed on Netflix's Twitch, which is twitch.tv slash Netflix. And I believe uh, we're doing it tomorrow at, I want to say, 5 p.m. 3 p.m. 5 p.m. Pacific. 5 p.m. Dang it. Yeah. Son of 5 p.m. Pacific. Thank you for 7 p.m. Central. My... Yes. 8 p.m. Eastern. Uh, for, for those listening in the archive, if you're catching this way after the fact, I'm sure you'll be able to find it online somewhere. I'm definitely yeah. going to try to tune in myself live, though. Yes, and it's it, it's September 3rd, so if you're listening to this and you're like, dang it, it's now <laughs> October. Well, then, sorry, you missed it, but I'm sure it was good and fun, and we're going to be doing, like, a table read of, like, uh, uh, 
uh, episode three, which is interesting because we don't actually do table reads for anime. So I'm like, I'm, I'm excited to actually get to interact with the other actors and it'll be, That's it'll really be fun. Good. That's really cool. Yeah, sounds like it'll be a hell of a lot of fun. Thank you once again for joining us here. Oh, my and pleasure. Thank all of, yeah, and thank all of you for popping in and listening to the TopCast Pod Show. We hope you're all staying happy and healthy out there. And we'll see you guys next time. Peace. Later. We're going to find your perfect match with the power of algorithms. All right, Haida, hold on to your butt. Your soulmate's name is... <laughs> <laughs>